Sushal, village councils, <laughs> residents of Aishalton, and I know we have representation from about six neighboring communities, community leaders, miners, and some of you are persons who are engaged in the forestry sector, but more particularly, our children, bright, hopeful, and certainly promising faces that we see here today. Let me say that I'm happy to be back in Aishalta, but this time wearing a different cap for the last five years or so, whenever I visited I Charlton, I visited as your Minister of Agriculture. Today I'm visiting and meeting at your invitation as the Minister of Natural Resources and the Environment. And this is a new ministry which the President has created and establish so that we can better manage our natural resources, our forests, our minerals, our other rich natural resources, be potential in oil and gas, as there is in some parts of the Rupununi or in the offshore area, but managing those in sync or in harmony with our environment because it is the philosophy, and we were certainly inspired by you, our first people, that man and nature must coexist. And this coexistence must be done in a way that it brings not only benefits today, but benefits in the very, very long future for our children, grandchildren, children, and for all those who will inherit this space. And we hope that through the work of the ministry, we can further that philosophy and further what our ancestors, what our first people has practiced and what we can do in this new and changing situation that we can achieve the balance. The balance of developing and using our but at the same time protecting, preserving and respecting our environment and the people who live and also depend and also who in a way contribute towards its preservation growth and even its ultimate use for all the peoples of Guyana. And so we hope and we will continue to engage all communities in our country because the natural resources of any country, of any land, of any nation, no matter where and no matter who or what group populates that country, that land, that area, no matter the economic status or the advanced stage of development, or the lack of development in those places, the natural resources belong to the people. It is not the preserve, it is not owned by any agency, it is not owned by the government, it is not owned by anyone overseas, but it belongs to all the people. And when we say about all the people, we mean all the people of Guyana in our situation. And that is why consultations, interaction, and constant engagement are important principles that we engage in. Especially when it's development, when it's access, and when its availability can directly or indirectly affect people who live within 
or even nearby. And that is a constant focus, a constant emphasis that we will continue to give in the management of our natural resources and at the same time ensuring that the treatment of our environment, what is considered our natural wealth, that that treatment continues to be one in which all of us are proud, all of us are happy, and all of us see the benefits. But we're meeting here today at the time when there are important national developments in our country. Some of it good, and some of it not so good. Many of you would be aware that we just that is the mechanism through which village, regions, and the country as a whole for the next year the resources will be made available so that we can undertake projects in education, we can bring about better, better education sector, an improved health sector, better infrastructure, road, bridges, on the network, whereby we can look at policies and arrangements and measures so that we can create jobs and opportunities, whereby we can look at special funds that look at Amerindian development, special projects to us to revive and improve the village economy and make it much more vibrant and make it much more lasting. And that is what the budgetary process is about. When a budget is presented, as we have done, as our government has done for the past 21 years, it is to create a better and an improved standard of living for every single village in this land and every single corner of our nation to ensure that they benefit from that development agenda. But we've had a budgetary process over the past two years because of the political makeup of the parliament whereby we have seen attempts to stall and attempts to deny rapid development in many of our communities including your communities right here in Region 9. And that is why I say we are meeting here when there are good things are happening and when there are not so good things that are happening. And that's one of the not so good things that has taken place in recent times. Whereby close to 37 billion dollars has been cut out of the budget. And a significant amount of that were for projects under the low carbon development strategy. And more particularly, how that relates to you, there was one of those projects included what we call the village development projects that were conceptualized by the Ministry of Amerindian Affairs in consultation with close to 170 Amerindian villages right across this country, where projects were developed in consultation and reflected the aspirations so that we can transform the village economy, so that we can make the Amerindian communities much more economically sustainable and viable. Though that project that means that this year, close to 75 of those 170 communities would have been targeted and they cannot, and many of those are in Region 9, they will not be able to access those resources. And that's one example. A second one that suffered was the land titling project, where you had requests for extension and, and persons who were waiting for the areas to be demarcated and Amerindian communities that entire project was also cut out. And we've made it quite clear to the political opposition with the one seat majority that if you want to take political spite, take it on the PPP civic. Do not take it on the villages, on the Amerindian communities of our country. Take it out to the PPP civic. It is unfair, it is unjust, it is illogical, and it is in fact a crime against 
these communities to be inflicting such harm and holding back development. And one wonders, and I ask the question, by cutting out those projects, and also another one was the hydro project too, where are we going to make our entire country the first in the world to be, to, as it were, to have its energy source totally from, uh, from non-fossil source, meaning we're going to use renewable energy in this situation, that to win. Another one went to was a project that looks at all of the, maintain all the air strips in our country. How it is planned to be able to come to your village or other villages? How it is that we can able to manage the cost of transporting food and supplies? How it is that we can able to evacuate people in medical emergencies? That entire project was also cut out. And it beats me as perhaps it beats you and the entire country as to why. And we say why were these things done? What did the communities do to the opposition to suffer this? Because what I'm telling you is not the government or Robert Fassad making up the story. This is what took place in our National Assembly. And we've met, take for instance, the ambassador from Norway. When I met with her and we were updated in the project, she was totally as we say, flabbergasted, confused, couldn't figure out why would, a, why would an opposition, because it has a one-seat majority, harm the people of this country who need development the most. Why? And those who inflicted that type must answer. And they must come to you and answer. Not stay in Georgetown, not go on the television, not go and misrepresent here that can do these things. That's a total fabrication. That's a total fabrication because the little token amount that is left there will not be able even to move any of those initiatives forward. So, brothers and sisters, that's one of the not so good things happening in our country. And we need you to be aware of this. Because when you will ask what about our project, and why it is the strips are not being repaired on time. And why it is we are not seeing the benefits of the low carbon development strategy coming out to the areas. I just provided you with the answer. Because you will be frustrated as we are in the People's Progressive Party. Because here it is, the people of this country, our first people who live within and around our forest, where may that is makes up the 88% of our landmass of our country, we've been able to provide an ecological services. The country has been able to earn more than 70 million US dollars. The resources are in an account being managed by both the World Bank and the IDB and the opposition in parliament takes that out of the budget so that money cannot come into the country. And you will ask why it is we cannot be able. And those who come and pretend to be representatives and care about your interests, we need to ask them. And they need to be accountable. As much as we try our best to be accountable to the people of Guyana, we committed to that. They also need to be accountable for reckless and irresponsible action. And that is one of the not so good things that has taken place. But amidst that, issue and the president has made it absolutely clear that he has gotten a mandate. It is his constitutional responsibility to serve for all the people of this country. He will do all that is legally possible to have those cuts restored. And that includes, we are not bitter. We haven't shut the doors of the opposition notwithstanding the harm they have done. The President has made it clear that we continue to be open to the opposition even to discuss those and other matters. Because at the end of the day, the management and the progress and the destiny of this country is not in the hands of one party or one group or the government alone. We've made it quite clear that we want the destiny of this country to be fulfilled and the vast potential to be realized with the involvement, through the involvement of all parties, all groups. Not to show who is the majority interest, 
Not to show that I can do this or not, uh, you cannot do the other. It is for the interest. And we're very disappointed that in light of those developments, there are certain groups and NGOs who have been very vocal in attacking the government. Some, many of the instances, have been misrepresenting the, 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 the government policies. And some are even coming out to different years. They have not said a single word. There was one MP who even described the Rupatuni from the opposition as the most backward place. What an insult. What an insult. And no one, none of these NGOs that profess, several of them that profess to speak, has not said a single word. But I want to assure you, brothers and sisters, that we will not be daunted in our resolve, in our commitment, and in our interest to take Rupununi as a whole and our country as a whole forward and to ensure that every single village that even with the constraints that we have that we will move ahead move ahead with your guidance and with your support in ensuring that development continues and to show those who want to hold the wheels of development from turning that they cannot stop the people of this country and they particularly they cannot stop our indigenous brothers and sisters. But there are many other good things now that are taking place. Our economy has been the only economy within this region to have, to have accomplished six years of growth. We are the only economy, not even within you look globally, whereby we've been able to increase expenditure on important areas of people's development. We're the few, one of the few countries in the world whereby we spend 30% of our budget on what we call the social services, particularly health and education. And we are embarking on what we call some major projects that will transform our country, create opportunities not only for today's generation, but for the students who will graduate and those benefiting from, from this uh, secondary school and the facilities that we put. And we intend to expand even right here in Region 9, but also those who will be coming into the school system, they can be assured of a bright and a prosperous future. And we are committed to that vision. And the international community and all the stakeholders are committed to in giving us the support and working with us, drivers or sectors to that development and that transformation, not only, but one of the key, is how it is do we develop our natural resources? How it is also, do we manage our environment so that it, also, it becomes not only a natural asset, but also an economic asset to communities, but also to the country as a whole. And the government and our president, we made it quite clear, one, that we will ensure that the resources are made available in a fair and even-handed way to the people of Guyana. Secondly, that we will ensure that in the development and utilization of those resources, people's rights are not affected, that their land, legitimate land areas, title, demarcated, that those are not infringed, and that there's also respect for culture, respect for the rights of all our people. We will not sacrifice our people's tradition, our people's way of life. We will not sacrifice the integrity of our environment on the altar of just economics and also ensuring that we are poor from our natural resources. No. We believe, as is outlined in the Low Carbon Development Strategy and outlined in our clear commitments, that we can develop our natural resources for the people of Guyana. Benefiting the people of Guyana. And I'm emphasizing the people of Guyana for reasons that we need to ensure to 
Because we have another problem that is developing, especially as it relates to our natural resources, where persons outside of this country, without following the required mechanisms, are illegally, some of them are illegally participating in the utilization of our natural resources. And we intend to continue and to enhance our efforts to ensure that the people of Guyana are not cheated or nor are they denied these opportunities because of those who may want to violate and I speak here of persons who come from outside of our country who want to violate whatever regulations and laws that we have in the utilization and in the development of our natural resources. And I'm saying that our policy, we are not against working, but they must comply. And we call on everyone, communities, villages and everyone, that in our quest to better and to manage our natural resources, that we ensure and insist and demand that they, these individuals, that they follow our national laws and they respect not only our people, but they respect our national laws and our communities. And we intend to take a firm grip in this regard because it is protecting your interests and protecting the resources of our country. I want to, in so addressing, I want to come specifically with some issues of interest to some of the communities here. And this as it relates to the issue of mining. Our policy has been that access to mining properties must be done in a fair, equitable, and a transparent manner. That whatever we do, it must meet the highest standards of accountability and responsibility and also must be consistent with our Mining Act and the mining regulations that we have in addition to other regulations that directly or indirectly affect the mining sector. We will not discriminate against or for any group or individuals as it relates to having access to mining property. We will ensure that every single person, individual, grouping, communities, that they have access and an opportunity to so participate consistent with the laid down guidelines. Because one, it will set a bad precedent, and two, it is bad governance. From the time we discriminate, we violate, and in a way, we disrespect our own national laws and conditions in so administering. Having said that, I know recently there were concerns about areas, well there are several concerns, several issues. When there were illegal mining taking place in a PL that was given in a Burundi mountain area. And as is required under our laws, action had to be taken. As a result of that, it was an unfortunate situation and our courts have already taken necessary steps as it relates to a particular action conduct of, of a police ramp. And that matter is before the court. So no one can say that the state, in its pursuit of upholding the law, omitted to, as it were, to correct and take action if they were excesses. And that matter is before the court. And I know they were concerned the persons who had to be removed from that area because it was a violation of our law. Another concern too 
was the areas that were being made available for the public lottery. And the lottery that was described by our land management officer there as to whether or not, and it was this misrepresentation that the area fell within a proposed extension, which is absolutely not true. It's clearly outside of the extension, and even there was a buffer, as is required by the GTMC, between the area that was being made available. And not the area that was being made available to everyone. You have to be part of the region. It was the area being made available to the residents, to the communities within Region 9. It wasn't an area that was being made available to, every, to anyone else who wanted to, but with that emphasis. And that was another concern. And the third area too was, and the third concern, well, some of the requirements to participate in the lottery by itself prevented some persons from getting involved. And of course, the issue too were that there were several complaints that we would receive where persons who were working with illegal miners, several of them Brazilian, illegal Brazilian miners, were not paid. And they could, their income or their arrangements were not being honored. And those were four concerns. And immediately, we had the GGMC staff, and I held several meetings with different representatives who were one way or the other affected or not. Local representatives, we engaged. Some I even met with some of the political personalities who came into the area and who were... I met and we provided all the facts. We were open to suggestions. And we remain open to suggestions, and that's why we're here. How it is that we can address those, and perhaps there are other concerns. But I want to narrow it to those particular concerns in my, in my initial remarks. And let me address the four in the order that I've stated them. First, is that we made it quite clear that we cannot allow the violation of our mining act. That the government's policy is that we will not condone illegal mining. Not only illegal mining in Region 9 or in the Maroni Mountain, but illegal mining in all our mining districts. And every single day, we have teams as part of the operation of the RADO who are going out and to deal with this issue. We are increasing our staff. We are putting in 15 more 13 temporary stations. We are building 8 per permanent mining stations. We are trying to collaborate with different agencies across our entire mining years to deal with this problem. Even our staff too, at the GTMC, have given clear instructions that if they condone and allow the violation of our mining act, they will face the consequences. But we have problems there too. Because there were things that were taking place right here in Region 9 that the GTMC staff was fully aware of. And in fact, I've seen statements where they were even, it's claimed they were even being complicit. And those will be investigated. And they will be dealt with firmly. And we intend to be not only telling people who are engaged in it, but those staff who have the responsibility in monitoring and ensuring compliance and enforcement that they do their job. We either do or we leave. And that is the clear instructions that we've given on our part. So I'm not coming here and saying that the problem is only persons who are engaged. We need to do a better job in monitoring, in advising, and ensuring that people are not misled. Because from time to time, some people said they were misled. And we need to stand that out. And stamp it out, we will. So on that particular issue with the Maruni, I know there was a concern that the PL, sorry, not the PL, but because it was converted to a mining license, subsequent in 2009, I think it was. It was converted to a mining license in 2009. There were not much activities taking place. And I was there about 
in Lethem. And I met with some of the persons who represented the small miners in this area. I think we met at um, St. Ignatius. We met at St. Ignatius. And there, the issue was raised. And I gave a commitment then that we will look, one, in identifying areas that were closed and make these available to communities and those who want to be engaged in mining through the process of a lottery. And I honor that. And we were able to do that on April the 26th it was when we had that lottery in all the areas. But further to that, on the issue of Maruti and the company that was there, we wrote them and said, we need to ensure that the property that you have, that it is put into some use. But further to that, we said that because of the growing demand, we need to have a part of that area come back to the state. And we were able recently to have an agreement that has not been completed because it has to be gazetted, the area has to be demarcated and so forth, to have a, an area just in excess of 2,000 plus um, acres whereby those will come back to the state within that particular area for a process of distribution based on a fair and an open way. And that is what we will intend. And you will hear and you will read about it. Because I know it is said, and I know who has said it to, that the minister or the ministry or the GTMC intends to take this area and give it to X, Y, and Z. And that is the type of misinformation. That is the type of misrepresentation that leads to confusion and it may create some level of discomfort in community. The area has not even come back to the state and there's a process by which it has to come back because we have laws in this country. We have regulations that we have to follow. It is not a wild west where things are done because someone feels and wants it to be done. We have to abide by the law. And so I wanted to address that first one as it relates to mining in that particular area. And once that process has been completed, it will be made known and everyone will have an opportunity to participate through a mechanism that is provided for in our laws. I can't create because when there was a discussion about a special lottery for those to follow the guidelines, we intend to be open, we want to work with everyone, but we have to ensure that we follow that guideline. And then I, we have the map there. And the, yeah, and so that is how we will proceed in, in, that, second, uh, in that first area. The second issue too, I'm not sure how many of you will be able to see this. Uh, it's a bit small. Yeah, the map is a bit small, but if you look at it closely, and we take a lot of interest in ensuring that areas identify that these areas do not infringe on other boundaries because we've had problems in but particularly Amerindian areas. And you see clearly that is demarcated the market, the market here, the areas for the lottery are totally outside of the area, and that's the second concern and also that it does not infringe in any area that is being applied for for extension. And that is clearly demonstrated in the maps that were provided and it's certainly um, shown here. We also have the areas that were applied for and the recent lottery was pointed out um, by the officer where it close to 120 something persons um, were successful in applying and we will have to go through the process. And the 170 something that is remaining um, is also clearly identified. But having said that, <clears throat> I want to move to the third area, or the third concern. We recognize that not everyone would be in a position in, in, in this particular area to own a dredge or to own the required equipment. And this is what we decided to do. 
we've decided to waive that requirement. And for the remaining land areas that were not subscribed, we will be holding a lottery. Not only in Region 9, but in all the mining district, but the more concern to you, sometime in mid-July, because there's a requirement whereby these persons have six weeks to apply. Well, I'm advised more to the end because of the time that is required, where these persons who would have applied in these particular areas, <coughs> excuse me, they will have had six weeks to apply, then it has to be verified and then given the necessary permission. By the time that process comes to an end, we're very clear as to which areas are available and thereby we'll be able to embark on another lottery. But that lottery will be able to accommodate the concern raised that persons may not have access to equipment or they may not as far satisfy those demands. So that is the, 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 the third point that I wanted to, uh, to, to address and the third concern um, that we want to raise in this regard. But generally, I want to say that as the intention here this morning is to listen to you, is to work with you in addressing your concerns. We want people, we, we want everyone, as it, as it were, who, is, who are interested and want to satisfy the conditions of our laws to participate in the mining sector, to participate in the forestry sector, to participate in the development of our natural resources, also to participate in activities that lead to better conservation and management of our environment. We want to provide those opportunities. We want to work with you. That's what we're here for. We're here to serve. But we also have to do that consistent with our laws, with our requirements, and in a fair way. And I do hope that by at the end of our discourse here today, that we can have an understanding. And I'm here to listen. My technical team here is we're here to listen to work with you. But one other point that I omitted to make that also in this, in the upcoming lottery, as even as a concession to, that persons will be able to pay and pick up their form and register for it in Letem. They don't need to go to Georgetown as is required. That will be provided for right at Letem, where it gives ease of access for persons to participate and to be part of this process. For we here to work, but I want this relationship that we have as it has always been, to be open, to be constructive, and as it were, to be one that is in the interest of the development of our country. And not to be made of politics, not to be made of some external interests running around and misrepresenting people, but the interest of the community and the development, and that there's full respect for people's rights, and there's full respect for people's involvement and participation in a way that will continue to make your community, your region, and to make our country a very proud place and a place in which we can continue to see development. There will be challenges. We will have differences from, point, from time to time. That is the process of development. But at the end of the day, we should all and ought to be committed to the development and progress of Guyana. Thank you very much. Based on the points and concerns 